Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining um, NASA's first ever joint webinar with another association. We're really excited to be hosting this with the National Young Farmers Coalition today. I don't know if anybody who was on the phone is on the phone or on the webinar um, was at annual meeting and was able to see the amazing presentation that we received from the National Young Farmers Coalition. Uh, but we're really excited for this as a follow-up to that and as a venue to see how we can work with them more, not only at the federal level, but also at the state, at the state level. So thank you all so much for joining. Before we get started today, we are just going to have a quick roll call of people who are on the webinar so that we know who we're speaking with. So could... Anyone on the phone from WASDA please announce themselves? I know I see a couple. Maybe we're having some audio problems. All right, we will, can, can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you. Too. Great. How about how about anyone from NASA? Can anyone from the Midwest please say who's here with us today? How about from the Northeast? I know, I know I see names that are from these regions, so maybe I will um, try to get this roll call afterwards somehow, David, if that's okay. Um, yeah, that works. And maybe, okay, great. Maybe we can just get started. So, Dave, um, thank you, everybody, again. Just for your reference, today's webinar is going to be recorded, and I will pass it over to National Young Farmers. Great. Thank you, Brett. This is David Howard. Um, I'm the Northeast Campaigns Director for the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, thank you so much to Britt and NASDA for giving this opportunity, and thank you all to those uh, who are with us today for joining us for this presentation. Um, we hope that you enjoy it and find it useful. Um, so with me today from NYFC is Andrew Berenberg, our National Policy Director, uh, Kate Greenberg, our uh, Western Program Director, uh, Holly Ripon Butler, our National or, uh, Land Access Program Director, and um, we're going to give you an overview of, of what we do and, and some examples of state policy. And I'm, I'm going to kick it off to Andrew to open things up. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so this is Andrew Bramberg. As David said, I'm the National Policy Director. Uh, I am based in Washington, D.C., um, focused right now on hopefully getting a, a farm bill done. Um, as well as a lot of USDA um, engagement as well, and hopefully got a chance to meet some of you at the NASDA meeting in Hartford um, just recently, where I was and um, our boss, our executive director, Lindsay lusher shoot also led or was on a panel um, about workforce development and land access for young farmers. Um, so this is a great continuation of that conversation. Uh, so a bit about NYFC, we've been around since 2010. Um, we're founded by a group of young farmers in the Hudson Valley of New York who were all experiencing very similar challenges accessing farmland uh, to get their farm businesses off the ground. Um, it did not take them long to realize that this was a shared challenge um, across the country, uh, regardless of, of state and region. Um, so found the need for uh, uh, an organization national in scope uh, advocating specifically for young farmers uh, and essentially claiming a seat at the table uh, for, for young farmers to, to be their own voice in policy conversations. Um, so since then we have grown into um, a national organization with 41 chapters in 28 states. Um, all of our work is farmer led um, coming from those, those chapters and our grassroots network of, of young farmers across the country. Um, we essentially work in three distinct ways. Um, policy 
ha has been the bread and butter of, of our organization, um, addressing structural barriers that, that young people face in trying to enter careers in agriculture. Um, we also focus, as I said, on building out a network of young farmers um, to do things like share skills, um, support one another, um, have a dialogue across states, across regions, um, and even just to, to create some sense of social solidarity, particularly for young people in, in rural areas um, trying to, to make it as small business owners. Um, and then the third kind of leg of the stool um, that we've increasingly invested in is business services. Um, and that helping our young farmers um, prepare for FISMA regulations, for instance. Um, we do trainings across the country to help young farmers be better credit applicants um, and apply for FSA loans, farm credit loans, um, that type of stuff to try and, and simply make their businesses more viable and more flexible um, to regulatory structures that are, that are coming down and that they're having to adapt to. Um, so I'll stop there. If David, um, if we're not already on it, I unfortunately can't see this. <laughs> um, but we get the number one question we get a lot is um, why young and and so we <laughs> we do our best not to to have a rigid definition of what makes a young farmer. Um, typically, we're dealing with farmers under under forty, like in their twenties and thirties. Um, but we know that being a beginning farmer is not specific to young people. Uh, we see quite a few. Um, beginning farmers coming into their careers as a, kind of a second career option. Um, definition of beginning farmers at USDA is the first 10 years of production. Um, a lot of what we advocate for um, on both the state and federal level is, is, is focused on beginning farmers in that sense. Um, so I think we'll run through a bit about our, our National Young Farmer Survey. Um, so last year we conducted a national survey of young farmers across the country. Uh, we surveyed just under 3,000 farmers under 40 years old um, to ask basically soup to nuts, what are you growing? What are your top challenges? Um, what opportunities do you see um, to get a sense of, of what we're dealing with and to really form the basis of our policy platform? Um, so from that, we identified four top challenges that were the most commonly cited, um, not only among current farmers, but we also asked both aspiring farmers, um, people who hadn't yet started their careers in farming but wanted to, as well as um, young people who had been farming but stopped. We wanted to know why. Um, and these four challenges were were common among those three groups. Um, access to farmland is by far the most pressing challenge, um, the top barrier that we focus on in all of our federal work. I would say it's sort of the North Star of our um, policy work. Uh, student loan debt is uh, one that is, I think, unique to this generation of farmers, um, but something that we're seeing not only for so-called first-generation farmers, um, young people who did not grow up on farms and are coming to it um, as adults, but also this, this number, this challenge was cited um, by a surprising number of multi-generation farmers. So your farm kids who are going to ag schools, um, who want to return to the farm, um, but, are, but are finding it challenging with student loan debt. Um, labor and health insurance, uh, certainly these are not unique uh, to young farmers. These are two of the top challenges cited across the board by farmers generally. Um, so I think I will stop there as we move into state policy and really what the meat of what we wanted to, to chat with folks about today. Um, so I will turn it over to uh, my colleague Kate Greenberg uh, to, to talk about some of the, the state policies that we've had success with across the country. Great. Thanks so much, Andrew. And thank you, everybody, for taking the time today to join us. Uh, my name is Kate Greenberg. I'm the Western Program Director with the National Young Farmers Coalition. 
Um, I had the chance to meet or see many of you, I hope, at WASDA um, in Salt Lake this, uh, this summer. So I'm glad to be looping back on some of our work. Um, so I'm going to start just by giving an overview of kind of where my work looks like at NYFC and then setting us up for um, the specific state policies that we've been working on both out west and across the country. So my work is to run the Western program with the National Young Farmers Coalition. Um, essentially, what that means is we are bringing a regional context to our national work. Um, you'll see here on the slides a picture of one of our members, Tyler Hoyt, who is a young farmer in Mancus, Colorado, here in the Four Corners where I live. Uh, uh, Tyler is part of our Four Corners Farmers and Ranchers Coalition chapter and has been a, a core part of our work on uh, addressing Western issues in policy. So um, just a brief background on what the Western program does. So I, you know, as a program director out here, I am tasked with uh, implementing a lot of the national work that we do. So thinking about what are the barriers that young and beginning farmers and ranchers face out West. Um, and then also making sure that Western needs, those needs specific to the Western context are represented in state and federal policy reform. So we focus a lot of our time on water um, and soil and a lot of the, the resource needs that um, impact producers in especially the arid West much differently than other parts of the country. Um, so we have done quite a bit of research on uh, ways that young farmers and ranchers can essentially weather what we anticipate is coming down the pike, um, changes in water availability, increasing water scarcity. Um, we are in our 20th year of drought in the Colorado River Basin. So thinking about uh, what we can do to make sure that young farmers and ranchers um, have decades of production ahead of them and, and the generations after that can still produce and grow food out west. Um, so within that, we are also thinking about other ways to make sure that young people um, are, are able to build um, successful and long-lasting careers in agriculture, both um, within that water context and, and beyond. Um, so the first uh, sort of state level work that I wanna talk about is actually not directly related to water. Um, it is related to workforce development. Um, and this is something that we have been talking about across the country. This is not Western specific, um, but you know, will ideally be serving um, farmers and ranchers here in Colorado and other Western states. Um, so sort of the context of this, um, you'll see some of the background on the slide of how we got to this Ag Workforce Development Program, um, which is a, a new program here in Colorado. Um, but we've really been concerned about the loss of um, agricultural workforce and the loss of young people from rural communities, especially and thinking about ways to bring young people back into ag. Um, so last year, 2017, um, we worked with the General Assembly here in Colorado to establish the Young and Beginning Farmers Interim Study Committee. So that committee was a bipartisan committee made up of three senators and three reps, um, so six member committee that met twice over the summer uh, of 2017. We worked with a number of partners across the state to identify some of the key barriers that young farmers across our organizations are facing. And all of us agreed that labor and land access were among the two top challenges that we needed the state to, to address. And so throughout that process, um, we had a number of testimonies, worked with our partners in the legislature, and eventually moved the bill through the, the General Assembly um, in the full session in 2018. Um, so the, the Agricultural Workforce Development Program was eventually signed by Governor Hickenlooper this May. And essentially what the program does is enable a cost share um, for on-farm and other agricultural business internships in the state of Colorado. Um, so we were hearing throughout this process that labor, the labor issue is twofold. For one, existing farmers and ranchers and agricultural producers are having uh, difficulty accessing labor, finding labor, and especially skilled labor. And the needs for that really run the gamut. At the same time, uh, young and beginning farmers and ranchers are, um, one of the challenges is finding a job in which they are, or an internship in which they can 
increase their skills and their real world um, engagement in ag. And so this bill was an, uh, one way to bridge that gap by enabling those beginning farmers and ranchers and those existing producers to meet one another in the middle um, and establish a relationship that's based on education, um, adequate compensation, and ideally a win-win for both parties. Um, so the uh, sort of terms of the program are that the state of Colorado will reimburse agricultural businesses up to 50% of the cost of a paid internship. Um, or up to $5,000 per intern. And the majority of that reimbursement actually goes to paying the intern. Um, it also goes to covering some of the overhead costs of the agricultural business, um, the hope being that you know, this will reduce some of the cost burden to those agricultural businesses for bringing on uh, young and beginning farmers. But we wanted to be sure that uh, those interns who are taking on this role are, are compensated for their time and work. So currently, the, the Department of Ag is um, wrapping up the rulemaking process. We will be uh, initiating that program at the start of the new year. Um, so we're looking forward to reporting back on how it's going. Um, we are also talking with our chapters and partners um, elsewhere across the West and actually across the country about what this could look like in other states. And I, um, just as with all the remaining bills we'll talk about, I hope this is something that piques interest um, in, in other states. So that's Colorado. I wanna talk about another uh, bill out in California, which is the Farmer Equity Act. And this is something that NYFC was not um, at the helm of, but which we supported as some of our members, our farmer members were directly um, engaged in, in moving this through. So in 2017, um, farmers and allies out in California created the California Farmer Justice Collaborative. And this campaign was to address historical discrimination in California agriculture uh, and to work toward building equity and access to resources, um, both financial resources and outreach and technical assistance. So uh, in 2017, this uh, work was moved into law. Um, and that law essentially directs the California Department of Food and Ag to improve resources, outreach, and technical assistance um, for socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. Um, I think I left that part off the slide. Um, and to provide greater decision-making power um, to historically uh, socially disadvantaged farmers and ranchers. So this is a great example of another farmer-led um, uh, effort to address those inequities and um, drive more resources to young and beginning farmers who have had uh, historically um, barriers in place to accessing those resources. Um, so this is something that we are um, also excited about, especially in thinking about technical assistance um, for more young and beginning farmers to be able to succeed. So with that, I will hand it off to um, Andrew. All right, thanks, Kate. Um, we will stay in the West, uh, and I will talk about a, a bill that we uh, worked on and that our chapter worked on in Washington State. Um, this one's a little bit different um, and is focused on farmer mental health, uh, so which has, has been a, certainly um, a topic that's gotten a lot of attention over the last couple of years, and rightfully so. Um, but it was one that had, we had not specifically worked on and engaged on um, in a very robust way until last year, um, one of the founding members of our Washington Young Farmers Coalition, which actually predates the National Coalition, um, they had already organized by the time NYFC itself was founded in 2010 and flew the flag, and one of its founding members has served on our board ever since. Um, but one of those chapter leaders um, took his own life last year, and it certainly sent um, uh, just waves through our entire coalition um, and was was a wake up call that that we needed to be more engaged on uh, the farmer mental health issue as well and, and farmer stress uh, so that chapter was of course motivated to um, bring its resources to bear on the policy level to try and address this challenge um, so they passed uh, or they helped pass i should say um, a state law 
in Washington state to do a couple of things. Um, and this is something that I, we know that other states have, have done versions of and hopefully more and more will. Um, it creates a task force uh, to study the factors that lead to, to high rates of suicide among farmers, um, as well as establishing a pilot program in two um, major ag counties in the state um, to provide resources um, in both English and Spanish to farmers um, and farm workers. Uh, and, and really like by bringing a coalition together uh, to get this bill passed, a, a pretty broad and big tent um, of ag groups and, and stakeholders um, also serve to, to kind of destigmatize this issue a little bit among the community of farmers in Washington state. Um, this has obviously gained some traction uh, on the federal level, and we've been engaged in helping um, introduce bills in both the House and Senate, uh, this, this Congress, the Stress Act in the House, and the Farmers First Act in Congress to reauthorize the Farm and Ranch Stress Assistance Network, um, which would provide you know, more federal resources to state agencies, extensive, the co cooperative extension, uh, community-based organizations, um, but really to support efforts like this, like Washington has, has started to get off the ground. Um, so we think that's certainly a bright spot um, and we'll be paying close attention to what that task force um, on the state level is able to, uh, to examine and, and to recommend. Um, so I'll turn from there to, um, to the Midwest. Uh, and this is something that, this is another bill that we're really proud to have worked on um, and that we think is an excellent model for states, uh, particularly pursuant to that land access challenge that I cited from our, our survey results. Um, so Minnesota became the first state uh, in, in the nation last year to, to pass a beginning farmer tax credit for the sale of farmland and farm assets to beginning farmers. Um, Iowa and Nebraska had had similar laws on the books for um, rented and leased land um, to provide a, a, a tax credit for landowners who, who rent or sell or rent or lease rather land to beginning farmers. Um, Minnesota is the first state to to do that and as well as expand it into um, sales of farmland and and farm assets, which we think that having a 5% tax credit for the sale of farmland is really important. Um, obviously, creating pathways like renting and leasing uh, for beginning farmers is an important step in um, you know, young farmers' career, uh, but, but really long-term farmland tenure, um, we think, is, is critical. And so we were really happy to see that included in the Minnesota bill. Um, I should say that uh, the Central Minnesota Young Farmers Coalition, our chapter there, um, worked really hard again to, to to build a big tent coalition to help pass this law. Um, Minnesota Farm Bureau was played a key role. Minnesota Farmers Union, um, some of the the smaller, more progressive ag groups in that state um, showed up, as well as even non ag groups, but but rural economic development groups who who saw. Um, farmland transition is key to their work as well, um, helped with some of the heavy lifting. The other really important um, piece about that bill to note is that in order to be eligible, the beginning farmer has to first take a financial management course approved by, um, approved by the state government. Um, and so that's basically getting you know, both sides of the coin. So it's helping to, to reduce the barrier for retiring farmers to sell farmland to a beginning farmer, but also making those beginning farmers um, better business owners, business planners, and financial managers, um, which of course helps reduce the barrier to, to credit as well, right? And helps them be better credit applicants. Um, so we're really proud of that bill. Um, we've had We've had conversations with a lot of interested state legislators as well who, who want to see that, that type of legislation come home to their state. And so it's one that we're really excited to, to hopefully work with some members of this group as well to, to try and replicate in other states. Um, and the first year of returns looks like it, it's both 
being widely used and, and fairly effective. Um, so I'll kick it to Holly to talk about more of our land access work um, and segue into some of that work. Thanks, Andrew. Hi, everyone. This is Holly Rippon Butler. I am the Land Access Program Director with the National Young Farmers Coalition. And I'm based in upstate New York, uh, where my family has a small dairy and beef farm that I grew up on, uh, just to give you a little sense of my background. But I, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our land access program at NYFC, what we're doing, what we're thinking about, why we are so focused on this issue that, as you saw, is the number one challenge that young farmers and ranchers across the country are facing, and um, a little bit about some of the state level policy that we've worked on within our program. So um, to start, this is a picture of our report from 2013 called Farmland Conservation 2.0. And this is really where uh, some of our land access program work began. Uh, this came out of the 2011 survey that we did, a national survey of farmers across the country. We found land access was the number two challenge at that time. And uh, the through the experience of our founding director, Lindsay lesher Shoot and her husband trying to find land to farm in the Hudson Valley, as well as their conversations with farmers around the country, uh, we were learning that land trusts were really a big potential that could help farmers address some of these challenges around land access. Um, we were finding that, you know, when we talk about the challenge of land access, what we really mean is there's a huge gap between the cost of farmland in this country and what farmers can earn from the business of farming, what they can bring in from the products that they sell. And this is because land is being valued for its uses other than agriculture. So land trusts are organizations, they're um, nonprofits, they can also, there can also be uh, municipal, municipalities that do this work um, as well, and they can use a conservation easement tool to help make the cost of farmland more appropriate for farmers. And so that's, this report is um, what we did based on a survey of land trusts around the country, um, where we found that nearly a quarter of the uh, 223 respondents had seen land that even though it was protected with a conservation easement for use as agricultural land, um, it had been taken out of production. It was no longer in farming, in farmer ownership. Um, and we also found that about uh, two thirds of respondents didn't know that there were new tools that this community could be using to address this challenge. Uh, and very few were working with beginning farmers. Interestingly though, 90% of the respondents said they would support targeting public funds to making conservation easements um, more uh, applicable, more um, stronger, stronger easements to help farmers. So that was the beginning of our land access program work. We started working with the land trust community to see how they could be better partners for farmers across the country. And since then, um, our work has really grown. So I would describe our program, the way that we talk about it is that we're focused on ensuring that farmland across the country remains available. So this is uh, free from development, it's available for agriculture, that it's accessible to farmers. So when it's um, changing hands, coming on the market, farmers have an opportunity to be engaged in that sale, they have an opportunity to access the land, um, and that it's affordable on a farming income, uh, as I was talking about, that they, uh, with the cash flow that they're expecting from their business, they can access financing to buy land and, um, and equitable. And this is both equitable in terms of uh, in if land is being leased, that there's fair sharing of rights and responsibilities, but also in thinking about who's getting access to the land, making sure we're addressing histories of dispossession and uh, inequality in access to land and financing for land, uh, and how we are helping make sure that ownership is um, is an opportunity there are pathways to ownership for all farmers and pathways to land security uh, so our program as i said has grown from engaging the land trust community to um, being a lot more broad in how we think about addressing this challenge and as you know land access as um, 
I, you know, have certainly come to learn doing this work is a really nuanced and complex challenge. It involves um, finance, it involves, you know, the resources on the land, uh, crosses over with Kate's work in the West a lot around thinking about water resources. Um, and so we're, you know, we're addressing this from multiple angles, but one way is continuing to do this coalition building with the land trust community and with local municipalities to build up capacity and knowledge of how they can be um, partners in making land more available, accessible, affordable, and equitable. And this we've done through trainings. Um, we've done trainings now in, uh, in nine states, with over 100 land, um, land conservation organizations. We are also offering farmer services. So this is right now very focused on the intersection of land and finance. We've developed um, a calculator tool called finding, that findingfarmland.org. And this is a mortgage calculator to help farmers um, really have more agency and uh, education around the financing for land access process. Um, recognizing that this is a really key challenge of making sure that they're both able to access land, but also accessing land in a way that sets them up for um, financial stability going into the future, and that they understand the costs involved. And then uh, the third piece is policy advocacy. So we're at the same time that we're focusing on providing tools to the, <clears throat> the individuals who work with farmers and to farmers themselves, we also want to, <clears throat> to work on addressing some of the structural barriers at the policy level. And we do this um, at the federal level. I've been working a lot with Andrew on the farm bill and we're very focused on the land conservation programs, in particular, agricultural conservation easement program, um, advocating for that program to be strengthened so that uh, it prioritizes funding for projects that not only protect land from development, but keep uh, farmer ownership as a key, key piece of that land protection and farm affordability. Um, we're also doing some of this work at the state level, so supporting chapters like uh, in Minnesota on, on that program. And then um, my coworker, David, will talk a bit about the campaign that we ran in New York last year. Um, we're also running a specific campaign in Pennsylvania um, on some of these challenges. Um, I wanna just talk briefly about some of the key statistics that uh, we're, and why we're so focused on this land access challenge now and what the urgency is. Uh, so as Andrew said, you saw in our, our most recent report from our uh, survey of farmers around the country, land is now the number one challenge that they're facing. Um, and this was really regardless of geography or um, even whether or not they were new farmers or had come from a farming background. And 17% uh, of respondents said that land was their, their most significant challenge. So um, it's, really, it's really huge for all of the young people who are, who are in farming. It's land and land challenges, related challenges, is, Really, it's the number one reason that um, farmers are not entering farming. It's the number one challenge for current farmers. And it's the top reason that farmers are leaving agriculture, which is really um, all of the areas that we're, we're working to, you know, to make sure that we're addressing it across and that new people, new farmers can enter and that we're not losing farmers once they've, they've started farming. Um, as I mentioned, I think there's, there's a lot of urgency to this right now. In, um, 2014 report from the USGA, we learned that nearly 100 million acres of, of farmland are expected to change hands at that time in the, the next five years, which uh, we're coming up on in 2019. So we're in this major uh, moment of land transition and uh, we're losing farmland. We lost 100 million acres of farmland in 2017 alone and 2 million farms. So we've, um, we've got to do work now to, to stem this tide of, of farmland loss. Um, there's also just, you know, I want to draw attention to the, the fact that we have, um, in, you know, the patterns of ownership in this country right now, 40% of our land is rented. And 45% of landowners of that land have never farmed. So we're in a... a time, like I said, when land is really being valued for its uses other than agriculture, 
Um, we're seeing an increase in foreign ownership of land, increase of land being thought of as an investment. And these are all factors that start to squeeze young farmers and, and individuals who really want to earn their income from farming out. And the security of, of ownership or um, at least having long-term access and ability to build equity in the land, we've seen is really key to establishing a viable business. So, um, you know, we just want to draw attention to policies and um, work that can help address those challenges wherever we can. Uh, what we heard from farmers about their challenges are that for the top is that they cannot find land, but the second one right behind that was that it costs more than the value of what they can produce. And right behind that was that it's really difficult for farmers to find land with appropriate resources. So as I said, you know, really complex challenge, lots of uh, moving pieces, but hopefully what that means is lots of opportunity to create um, innovative and progressive policies that can help address this challenge. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to David now to talk a little bit about how we uh, got at this in New York and, um, and then you know, how we're, we're thinking about um, where else we can bring this work. Thanks, Holly. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll just talk a little bit about the bill that we passed in New York State. Um, basically, the the point of, of this bill was to um, bring a a tool that um, focuses on, as Holly mentioned, um, farmer ownership and, af and affordability of farmland um, for farmers. Um, a tool that Vermont and Massachusetts had been using for some time, um, which is called an option to purchase at ag value. Uh, there. Um, we wanted to bring that model to New York. Some land trusts in New York had started to experiment with that and, and put that model into, um, into place in some easements. Um, and we worked with the Department of Agriculture in New York here um, to look at um, changing the farmland protection law to support um, that tool as a feature of the farmland protection program here in, in the state. And we were successful in, in doing that, and the department also uh, moved forward with kind of um, adopting that approach as a tool in the toolbox um, for the program. Um, so this law really kind of backs up that approach by putting into the statute that it's um, an eligible cost as a, as a part of an easement um, for state funding uh, going forward. And really, the, the key pieces of what um, are different about a traditional farmland conservation easement and an easement that includes an option to purchase at ag value or a preemptive purchase right, as we call it in New York, is that it includes um, a definition of a qualified farmer so that that land is, is only eligible to be purchased by uh, actual farmers. Um, it includes a, a clear definition of agricultural use value, which um, the bill that we passed in New York defines as the fair market value of a property that is restricted by an easement to its productive commercial agricultural use rather than the highest and or best potential use value for residential and other non-agricultural purposes. So basically kind of leveling the, the market uh, so that farmers are competing with other farmers when it comes to um, that real estate price for farmland. And the third piece is um, the ability to kind of enforce those provisions um, by allowing the holder of the easement uh, in New York, the BIA Land Trust, to come in and purchase that uh, land at its agricultural use value temporarily um, and find a farmer purchaser uh, in certain circumstances. So, um, we basically, the law is just to kind of um, put that tool in the toolbox in New York and also create an example for other states that are interested in bringing this new approach into their farmland protection programs. Um, it really creates a great example for how other states can do that. 